Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Announcement regarding public notice of the meeting. Notice of the time and place of these committee meetings was publicized by notifying the area news media, by updating the Open Meeting website, and by mailing this notice to each of the district's directors on February 10, 2014. Additionally, a copy of the Open Meetings Law and a copy of the agendas for today's meetings are available for inspection. We're going to begin today with the finance Saturday report and the <coughs> comments from the member director Kavanaugh. Okay. Good morning. Um, we have the coffee off or Sorry. Uh, I don't have the agenda in front of me, so I'll just start with the authorization of the range rates that we use at the Board Town Administration Decommissioning Funding Analysis. The, uh, the NRC requires the district to maintain an external trust fund for future decommissioning of the plant. The uh, district is, has been funding this trust since 1983 based on NRC defined cost formulas. The district updates the decommissioning funding analysis annually uh, with forecasted rates from the IHS Global Insight for decommissioning cost inflation and decommissioning future earnings. <coughs> The IHS earnings rates are based on a five-year treasury note. Uh, the earnings are adjusted for the decommissioning fund analysis to reflect the higher yield of the district's actual decommissioning fund as compared to the five-year treasury notes. The difference between the decommissioning funding earning rates and the decommissioning cost inflation rates is the real rate of return. Uh, used in, in our decommissioning funding analysis was greater than 2% in most years. Uh, consequently, the NRC regulations require that we obtain board approval for the real rate of return, which is greater than 2%. Uh, previously, when the real rate of return was greater than 2%, the proposed decommissioning funds great earning rate were included with the corporate earning plan uh, as approved by the part of the COP. The uh, NRC has questioned the earning rates. Uh, they question the earning rates used by the district within the past two years, prompting a review of the pertinent NRC regulations. Upon completing this review, it was decided that a separate authorization of earnings would be more appropriate than including it in the CLP. Therefore, we've got resolution 5983 that affirms the district may use earning rates shown in Exhibit A for 2014 in the decommissioning funding now, having said all that, <laughs> Edward, do you have yeah. to add anything? <laughs> yeah, I think that was well said. <laughs> well, I think the, the summary of this is we've, we've already, we've always done this analysis. We've always reported any time that a differential in real earnings rate is greater than two percent. In the past, that reporting occurred in a corporate operating plan documentation that you receive and approve. December of each year. Upon further review and questioning with the NRC, it became apparent to us that this is a better process to have this item come back before you separately approve it. It's a better uh, approval documentation, if you will. So this is nothing new other than the form in which it is requested for approval. Isn't this a uh, kind of a desire to have more transparency in case somebody is trying to use these higher rates of returns to lessen their contributions? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's the intent that of the be the, yeah. and, and so <coughs> to, that, you know, to that point, you can see that we're not creating the rate of return based on our projections, or, nor are we uh, using decommissioning inflation rates. We're using an independent source to tell us their, their view of the future. They just want transparency. <coughs> What is our uh, contribution rate for this year? That's a good question. I, we, we haven't funded this at all in a number of years because the earnings rates and funds available have been such that we could meet our, our balance as needed in 2033. The last time we updated this, which was last year, is to increase the funding amount. Um, and I believe we're putting in about $2 million? Three, about $3.4 million. $3.4 million in 2014. Edward, will you explain again why we have to report when our earnings are more than 2% rather than when they're less than 2%? It's, it has to do with the real rate of return. So when, when you look at a treasury, part of that 
it's, it's considered a risk-free investment. And so there's not a risk premium that's built in because it's the U.S. government. It is the safest, theoretically the safest. <laughs> <laughs> so so your, your bonds are keep going always have three, three, three factors. You look at what your overall inflation rate is. You look at what the risk premium is. And then you look at uh, what your return is. So if your inflation rate is 3% going forward, and your return is 5%, then your real rate of return is 2%. Because what that means is you're, you're earning 2% above the rate of inflation. Yeah. And so to them, I think anything above 2% kind of signals them that maybe that real rate of return is a little bit high if you need to disclose that and why. I think it is, as the chairman said, you're just worried that at some point, I don't think it's pretty transparent from what we've been doing, it just brings it clear, but the worry is that if you had some kind of real rate of return that was very high and didn't contribute, is it the right view to calculate it correctly and are you saying the true investments that you have, this allows us to take a look at that. Are you, are you going to get to the end of this, this period and realize that the account's underfunded? Yeah. And then maybe you don't necessarily have the funds to make that up. So they want to make sure every year you go through this that you're making the proper assumptions around the investments. And in, in, in parallel, we do submit this you know, sort of data to the NRC directly that says this is you know, the funding you can raise for return and, and, and why. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very <coughs> well, we, we had to have a tutorial on that as well. If we're yeah. doing better, yeah. um, but, but that's the reason. It's counterintuitive. <coughs> Um, Mr. Chairman, I've got an update on the status of our 2013 Series A bonds. Um, you might remember in April we authorized the, the uh, man to, uh, to sell up to $60 million in Series A subordinated electric system revenue bonds uh, to refinance existing debt if the debt uh, service savings in the market were met. And that authorization was effective through the end of last year. Uh, the market conditions were not favorable, and uh, therefore we didn't issue any, any authorized bonds. And as a result, the, the authorization has now expired. So management's going to continue to monitor market conditions, and uh, the, upon appropriate <coughs> means, they'll request that we authorize issue of revenue bonds at that time. So we have to reauthorize it. Exactly. Yeah. And then finally, we've got pledge securities. Uh, the state requires that uh, OPPD and financial institutions that hold our funds provide security protection or pledge securities uh, for the balance which exceeds the FDIC coverage, which is $250,000 effective January 1st. Pledge security amounts are determined by cash balances at each bank. Uh, which exceed FDIC insurance limits of that $250,000. As of January 1st this year, projected balances at Wells Fargo Bank and First National Bank are expected to exceed those limits. Uh, and OPPD has made arrangements with both banks to first pledge security sufficient to secure any balances which exceed FDIC limits. And unless there are further questions, that is the case for you. Thank you. Can we move on to the new growth section, Andy, and direct on the board? Yes. As everyone knows, that the NRC has granted uh, full government permission to restart the plan. And um, the plan produced 100% power on um, Christmas Day, December 25th. It was a nice Christmas present for everybody. Uh, the plan operated 100% power in remaining uh, December. Uh, however, on January 9th, if everybody can remember, it was about 19 below zero. It was a, uh, one of the um, employees at Fort Calhoun was making his own around at 1 o'clock in the morning outside the <coughs> river, looking down with a flashlight 20 feet down and noticing that there was ice built up on one of the uh, six gates uh, that you need to control water from the Missouri River. Uh, the gate couldn't fully close, so the decision was made to uh, shut down the plant until they could uh, fix that. The plant uh, status right now is uh, being um, maybe about 30% power, and we will give us a full report on that. <coughs> Other activities uh, that have gone on 
is that uh, Fred and I, Swell and I, uh, toured Fort Calhoun yesterday, uh, went to the alignment meeting, and uh, personally thanked all those who were at the alignment meeting for all the work they've done the past two and a half years in getting the uh, plant restarted. And we then took a tour and had a good time. Sort of a just being out on that uh, overlook, overlooking in the yeah, Missouri yeah, River and looking down there, down. it's an amazing thing that in the middle of the night that this the, inspector found the this place out. I mean, that means they were really doing a good job. Yeah. They, and made the right decision. And made the right decisions the whole time to do it. <coughs> you know, um, we were just amazing. Uh, anyway, we took the tour. Uh, the other thing that's been going on is that. Um, there is uh, and we're going to introduce Harry Goodman, who is chief of engineering. He's here today, and they had a lot to do in the past six months. He came in uh, July and has been chief of engineering since October. And Harry, if you want to tell us a little about yourself, where you come from, and since you come from, you're still in the Good morning. I do sound as if I just got off the subway this morning. You can tell I am a native New Yorker. Uh, I've been in the nuclear business for 33 years. Um, bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan. An MBA and an electronics degree as well. Uh, I was with Entergy for 25 years and eight years with General Electric before that. I've been through all leadership positions in engineering, all the way up to general manager of major projects. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of the Fort Calhoun story going forward. Thank you very much. Welcome. It's interesting when we were walking around uh, the engineering division, we had more than one person telling us how much they liked Harry's leadership and really appreciate it. So I think he is really making some good progress and uh, helping with the leadership in that department. So thank you for coming today, Harry. Thank you. Harry, are you going to be a uh, Michigan rival? Of, uh, are you going to be for the Michigan football team? Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> well, 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 I was saying that's the right answer, by the way. I was saying yesterday, Mr. Hanson asked to call him because he was getting a bullshit by Claire. And he said, you're going to have to switch that. <laughs> Uh, the next thing um, that we uh, discussed yeah. month is that we, uh, there was a nuclear uh, safety review board uh, gave us a report and it was very positive. Uh, the most positive that we've had in two and a half years, which I think is excellent. And uh, we're going to have uh, Mr. Douglas um, mention some of that later on. Uh, the other thing that I want to say as far as the NRC role, uh, the NRC is still there. Um, we are still under Chapter 0350. Um, we are going to have our next meeting tentatively February 27th. That's tentative. Uh, we have no idea when or where it's going to be, but uh, anybody wants to put that on their calendars for a tentative date. Uh, next time we have a meeting, give us a report. Yeah, thank you again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As mentioned, the significant work performed throughout the month of December by both the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Fort Calhoun staff. And as mentioned on December 13th, we did receive formal notification by letter that Fort Calhoun can begin the process of restarting the reactor. Uh, the NRC provided 24-hour notice <coughs> for the reactor startup, power ascension, and operations for approximately 10 days. We also had representatives from the Institute of Institute for Power Operations <coughs> on site as well as our own management and nuclear oversight in both the control room and the field. And uh, just a, a lot of good data, primarily focused on operations, but also on organizational support. Um, as we brought the unit back online. Uh, the final items that we did close off prior to that were primarily in the high energy line break area. Uh, and then the reactor was diluted uh, to criticality and control rods pulled <coughs> on 1848 at on 1218. So permission on the 17th. Remember we had heated the plant back up in standby. I uh, received permission and then with, uh, you know, with deliberate actions uh, took the reactor critical on the 18th. Uh, since this was coming out of the refueling outage, we did the low power physics testing and the plant entered mode one, greater than 2% power the following day on the 19th. And then breakers were closed at, uh, on 1221 and 2100, and as mentioned, uh, stabilized over the Christmas holiday. Uh, we do remain in the AOP1 acts of nature for a low river water level, which as mentioned, uh, that's even a, a little bit of a contributor to the icing that we had uh, on the sluice gate, as was mentioned on the 9th. 
Uh, just a couple of other items, though, on the 107, uh, we were down uh, just a couple of percent power to do moderator temperature coefficient testing. Uh, and that's pretty planned when we come out of the refueling outages and physics testing that we also do a full power. And you'll see us do that periodically through the cycle in a planned manner when we come down a couple of percent for about two days to do that uh, moderator temperature coefficient testing. That's just really validating the physics in the core as we, uh, as we proceed through uh, the cycle of operations. Uh, as mentioned on 1 9, the plant was shut down to repair an intake structure, a seascape that was found damaged due to ice buildup. Uh, we do have a causal analysis team right now that will look at you know, what is the prevention. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the detection, we think there's opportunities to detect that earlier, not to mention prevent it. Uh, but also, you know, the intake structure sluice scapes provide an important part of our flood mitigation strategy. And while not directly called out in the tech specs, the shift in the middle of the night with support from the team made the right conservative call to go put the plant in a known condition. We de iced the gate uh, and approximately 12 hours later closed the sluice gate, which uh, exited that condition. Uh, while we were shut down, we had a little bit of additional work. We had a containment penetration that had, um, I'll describe it as two drops every 10 minutes um, on a fitting both inside and outside of the containment. So we took the opportunity while we have plant conditions and containment access to go take care of that, um, take care of that item. And then uh, on the initial restart of the reactor on Sunday morning, we had an issue with one of our control element assemblies. And again, uh, about three o'clock in the morning, uh, reactor just taken critical. Uh, and I, 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 I'll say the equivalent of, of, of enough power at that, you know, at that level to probably light a couple of light bulbs, very low power as we're able to detect. We typically will stabilize the reactor and take data. And part of that stabilization process is when we saw uh, the control rod that was uh, was not working properly. And again, the operators took the right conservative reaction. Excuse me, action. Uh, we shut the reactor back down. Uh, worked through troubleshooting on that, and then uh, subsequently uh, restarted the reactor and put the unit back online at 14:11 yesterday. As mentioned, we're uh, currently in a hold at 30% power as planned. Uh, we used that 30% power hold. Uh, to clean up the secondary system uh, chemistry-wise as, uh, as you know, water's moving around the big pipes that we use to make steam. And uh, as we talked before the meeting, you know, our chemistry specifications are in the parts per billion is what we're monitoring. So we get less than one part per billion of sodium is when we say we're good to go up in power. And that's conservative, you know, for long-term asset protection for the steam generators, which I know many of you uh, went through the steam generator replacement. And so uh, in, in both of those situations, you know, one of the things that we reinforce with the operating team is we work through you know, other issues with equipment reliability, but the operators, uh, with the support of the team, making the correct and sort of decision in operations, and, uh, and that's what we want to be from an organizational standpoint. I'm just looking forward, um, both with the NRC and with the Institute of Nuclear Power, we've got a lot of activities over the next couple months. We had the CEO of IMPO actually out with us last Thursday while we were working through our issues. Um, uh, we scaled back a little bit uh, the visit, but uh, I spent a uh, considerable amount of time with him uh, just talking about, uh, you know, I'll use the illustration, you know, recognize where we've been, but emphasize where we are and where we're going. And uh, so it was his first chance to visit the station. Uh, then we spent a considerable amount of time in the plant, you know, looking at a lot of the physical work and cultural work that we've done at the station. And then had a nice lunch with uh, several leaders that weren't actively working on uh, you know, the, plant, uh, the plant issues that we were working through, including our, our young generation uh, officers for um, you know, our National uh, uh, Nuclear Young Generation Society, uh, as well as a, a couple of our emerging leaders. So just an opportunity uh, to, hear, uh, to hear Mr. Woodward, who's a retired admiral and runs the Institute of Nuclear Power, uh, on his philosophy of leadership and, and where, that, uh, where that organization is going. Uh, we've got our accreditation visit um, exit this Friday, and we'll be at the Nuclear Accrediting Board uh, second week in March. Uh, we've got the uh, Institute of Nuclear Power Operations crew performance evaluations, where they come in and look at four of our operating crews, going through emergency procedures, and we'll get some meaningful feedback from our industry peers on that. That is at the end of January, and then our plant evaluation the first two weeks, uh, the first two weeks in March. Uh, in parallel with that, um, we also have uh, our branch chief from the, uh, from the region help this week in, in a truly now coordination of post-restart um, inspections and commitments. You know, as part of our, uh, what we documented with the NRC was why we were safe for restart, how we had addressed each of the manual chapter 350 items, and now what are the items post-restart that are also in the commitment space. This uh, part of the letter that uh, allowed us to restart was a confirmatory action letter that we're under 
that dockets our full three star commitments. Uh, so we'll begin coordination of what that looks like, including you know a series of public meetings that I anticipate 2014. We mentioned one tentatively on February 27. That will allow us and the NRC to describe what the post restart scenarios look like for the station. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll maintain um, in manual track the 350 for a period of time as, as we populate the performance indicators that the NRC uses in the I'll say in the normal rack oversight process. So. Uh, we'll begin now. Uh, we do have done a lot, of, you know, a lot of work with the NRC since uh, start off with this law. We're working with our industry face to face this week, and we can anticipate a series of, uh, you know, smaller team but you know, inspections that are holding us accountable for, uh, you know, for the post restart commitments. Uh, uh, pending questions that uh, that is my update. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I appreciate it. Also in December. Um, we touched a little bit last month, but I'll, I'll just I'll build on. We did our emergency response organization graded exercise. And we do a series of emergency response drills, smaller scale with the states and counties through the year. Uh, this is a, a much broader scale, and it's, it involves also you know FEMA, which grades the states and the counties, and I mean a myriad of offsite resources. And so while we provide the uh, you know the event for which we uh, exercise the rest of the offsite facilities. <coughs> Uh, as well as also organizations, you know, part of the scenarios include, you know, mock, um, you know, car accidents that affect evacuation routes, and it really gives them an opportunity to exercise the broader aspects of the emergency plan. You know, we provide protective action recommendations to the states. Uh, the states are the ones that actually exercise, and, you know, and do the actual coordination of evacuations and mock evacuations. So that's an important part of the, you know, of the process. Um, as we work with the external stakeholders. And that graded exercise, I sat through the, um, the FEMA exit up in Blair, um, as well as the NRC's portion of that exit, and, and both, uh, both, uh, both went very well. But if you look at just, I'll uh, say, the sheer number of, uh, of support organizations that are involved in those era, you know, especially on the state line and, and having the states involved as a group coordinating activity. Never, never. Yeah, Great, thank you.
uh, so she has to be down for two and a half years. So that went very, very well. And now, obviously, uh, we need to focus on continu some continuous improvement. And uh, nuclear, oversight, nuclear oversight continues to work with Fort Calhoun uh, Station Management uh, to ensure effective and timely resolution of any issues. Uh, as I have mentioned before, we did have some issues. A lot of these issues have been resolved. Uh, some are still open. Uh, so in, uh, in the interest of time, I will share a very brief status of some of the functional areas uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, on the operation uh, side, uh, we do believe operation has improved tremendously. Uh, they did a great job with the restart, as I mentioned. You can easily sense the change in behavior uh, and the ownership and uh, uh, the follow through, so things are about working well. <coughs> on the maintenance, uh, we do have some challenges. And mainly those challenges are due to the lack of uh, the needed supervisors. Uh, but I do believe Lou is getting some help for that area. Uh, engineering has improved tremendously. And uh, you introduce uh, the new director. Uh, and he's really providing clear expectations and doing a great job on two fronts. Uh, one is being really proactive and he's inserting himself and monitoring uh, all the work that's being done at 25%, 50%, and 100%. Um, on the reactive uh, front, uh, when we're missing any work, uh, when we're missing days, uh, he's meeting with individuals and really focusing on why we missed it, how can we improve, and really providing uh, a good, clear feedback and focus on that kind of ability. So that, that's working really well. Uh, work management, uh, some challenges there, and mainly with the integration process, but we're pretty much on the right track. Uh, we continue to monitor that function uh, uh, very closely. Uh, same with the emergency preparedness and the chemistry, they are on the right track. Uh, security, uh, they had a very successful force on force. Uh, some challenge in staffing, uh, which now put a lot of demand on over time, but it, I do believe we'll uh, address that issue too. Uh, training, the accreditation uh, visit went very well. Uh, and was here, uh, obviously, and we're going to issue the final report on the 20th of March. Uh, but we expect that to be pretty good. Uh, environmental, uh, we don't see any showstoppers there. And finally, uh, the outage, uh, a little bit of planning, uh, but also uh, uh, the Fort Demonstration leadership and management are paying attention to that. So really, uh, you know, overall, we believe the station is doing a really good job. And, and obviously, now that we are online and doing well, we need to continue to focus on what can we do to uh, uh, continue to move toward excellence. I think that's going to be very challenging. I think it's going to take the whole team to focus on the, on the issues. Uh, and the nuclear oversight, of course, of the nuclear safety group work will continue to, uh, to be able to really uh, intrusive in a lot of areas and continue to monitor the right way uh, and audit and uh, give us great feedback and uh, bring any issues to the board that we believe uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, but so far, so good, and we'll continue to, uh, to monitor very closely. Thank you. And the report. Yeah, one thing that you mentioned that I don't know if everyone's aware of is that with the integration of for Calhoun Station's previous model to the Exelon model. And we're really sort of pushing that in now with the goal is that this will help us achieve excellence. And it's, you know, rearranging some organizational stuff and everything, and there's going to be some challenges. Um, Sherry, you have probably mm -hmm. one person who's you know, had a lot to do with that. Maybe perhaps next month you can see how we're doing. Because we're just sort of really sort of getting into that now. And there have been challenges, and there are some culture changes, and people, you know, rearranging people and everything. It's not a people thing that's happening, but it's very important as far as achieving our excellence. And perhaps next month we'll also discuss that a little bit. When we discuss that next month, I guess the question I have is, uh, you say we're moving towards excellence, and I can see the, the changes and all that. How do we measure that? <coughs> we can get assess some goals and say, yeah. is yeah. this plan compared to yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now that you know, we begin to populate you know, online data, uh, a lot of online data is you know, like three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, so we'll be you know, kind of building that. And you'll see us as part of the fleet, you know, we get a fleet scorecard, so it's nice to compare ourselves against the peers, and it's, it's, it sets up a little bit of you know, competitiveness. 
And then in the fleet, we set the goals to be top quartile, top decile each year, so that when we're measuring, we're not just measuring against ourselves. And so you know, that that aspect of being able to you know, measure performance, you'll see, is, is a key part of being, you know, being in the model. And then uh, as we go through the info process, also we'll, we'll set up some, you know, we'll set up some minimum stuff that says, you know, by this point in the year, we want to be, you know, this much closer to, you know, what would be an equivalent of the. You know, the middle of the pack for income and then the upper quartile as we work through this year. That's some stuff that we're working out in the institute. So, I mean, will that be given to the quarterly or semi? How do you, how are we going to see it? We can go ahead and score card for that. Right, we get that right now. We yeah, we'll get it. Yeah, we'll get it. I recommend what the oversight is. And that's what the oversight is. Yeah, you're tracking yeah, yeah. Well, we can't do that. Yeah. 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 And how often does info rating? Uh, yeah, yeah, just a couple years, 18 months. Yeah. And they have an official rating for us. Yeah. And that would be a real industry standard scorecard as well. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I will say that I was very impressed by the Emergent Leaders Program, yeah. and I'd encourage to have some more board involvement with that. Uh, you could do, just pick them out as you walked around, uh, even without men knowing what they were. But I think that's a really outstanding uh, way to develop in the future, Mo, uh, as going forward to pursue that excellence. They, uh, uh, they're really, they, you can tell they're, they're really vested more than I've ever known in this last tour that I had up there that they, yeah. they really take an ownership of this field. Yeah, and the last um, one, I was really impressed. And the last one, there was also another emergency leader, and I think every time you come up, yeah. they will be, yeah, it's going to say that. Yeah, part of their development. Is that part of the Exxon model, too? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, also, it's also similar to the model we use in Bradley in the district, and as long as we don't have four agendas, I'd recommend that uh, maybe in March we'll give you a little briefing on how we do leadership training in Bradley. Pretty, uh, com pretty not complex, but it's pretty complete in developing the emerging leaders because we've got a lot of these people here and we've got a lot of talent. And uh, I'm impressed by it. You are impressed by it. And, and the work we're doing to make sure they're getting up to speed and ready to go. And they are. They, they want the ball. Uh, they're ready to go. And I would encourage any board members that haven't been up there recently to get up there. Uh, uh, you're not in their way, they really appreciate it. Yeah. It's not like they're annoyed that you're there. They're, they're glad to see you. And uh, it's good for them and it's good to be exposed to the worst thing you should have. They'll tell you they're glad to see you for sure. Is that all? I think so. Okay, let's move on then uh, to Director Barrett and the Public Information. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yesterday we had a meeting with the Public Information uh, group and uh, we focused primarily on the 103rd legislative session which was the Nebraska Unicameral that started last Wednesday on January 8th. Uh, they have 10 meeting days to drop uh, legislative bills and uh, they're at the halfway point. Uh, several things that we discussed uh, in the 2013 session uh, are carryover and they're back. Uh, one of those is going to be net metering uh, which is going to be monitored. Uh, basically, the net metering is uh, going to increase from 25 kilowatts uh, to 125 kilowatts. And when I was talking to Tom, he said uh, 25 kilowatts would be an average home and a shed or a barn. And then 125 kilowatts would be a convenience store or a Walgreens. Uh, so it is a sizable increase in that also. Uh, there was a discussion on uh, what we call the externalities bill, which is it would change the, the Power Review Board's application process for for projects of more than $100 million or 25 megawatts to include health, environment, water issues. Uh, as you know, the uh, district has opposed this bill last year, and it's, it's back and it may be prioritized by Senator Hart. Uh, and, and Mr. Richards can give uh, a further update on that. Also, there was another bill about uh, membership employees serving on a uh, public power board and also working for uh, 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 public power also. 
And then uh, the final discussion that we had was just uh, the, the bill that popped up last week was the sale of uh, MUD, or the, or the possible discussion of the sale. So if, uh, on, on the details front, I think... Uh, yeah. uh, um, I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess just to kind of piggyback on what he said, he's done a good job of detailing all the time. Uh, we're reviewing bills. Uh, right now there's about 225 of them that have been um, introduced. Um, what happens inside of OBD is dependent on the content. We send those bills out, bills out for review. So I don't know, finance has gotten some of them, resources has gotten some of them, engineering has gotten some of them. So they all go out for comment and then it comes back to me try to put together a uh, recommendation for you all. I don't have recommendations at this point because we're still in the bill introduction period. Uh, and we're still evaluating what, uh, what goes on with the bills and what they do. Um, I guess that tomorrow or this, this morning I'll head out of here and the Nebraska Power Association has a legislative subcommittee and I'm a member of that committee. We sit every week usually on Wednesdays, but we're doing it on Tuesday this week, and we review bills as a group. We take a look at all the different bills that have been introduced, try to decide what kind of an impact they have on, on public power. Um, <clears throat> and then yes, or tomorrow, the board of directors of the Nebraska Power Association, which is made up of utility executives, will come together and we'll have a report for them as well. So there's, there's a lot of uh, eyes that are on bills and what they do, what they repeal, how they how they work, how they get intertwined inside of uh, our business. I guess the only thing that I would add to Director Barrett's comments would be the MUD bill. It's basically um, it was introduced yesterday. Uh, it eliminates the MUD board on January 1st, 2015. Um, it uh, communicates to its customers that it's terminating. It gives the while, while it's being terminated, it gives the board the direction to distribute the assets. Um, there's an update with the Urban Affairs Committee that they're supposed to do uh, on how that distribution is going. Um, and it eliminates those provision in MUD statutes that talk about if it wasn't going to be terminated, how it would be done, it would be done by a vote of people. And it eliminates the language in there, the bill eliminates that kind of language in it. So it's out for review. Um, I have no recommendation at this point. We'll, we, we'll review it in the uh, Power Association and we'll have some recommendations for the board tomorrow. But uh, we're in the study phase right now. So I, guess I don't normally come in January, but I want to give you a little update and our recommendations for you next week. Well, one discussion we had yesterday is that with net metering, you know, there, you know, more and more people are maybe wanting to use that meter. Right now, we don't have that many. As far as our rate structure may have to change, because if in California, everything with the solar and everything with the increase in the solar, there's been a lot of inequity that maybe Tim, you can explain sure. a little bit. And when this does come along, we're going to have to do it as far as the service charge and there's inequity that people who aren't using it that they are subsidizing. What? Using that yeah, we're, I mean, obviously we're under uh, the statutory guidelines to be fair, reasonable, not discriminatory. And so part of the concern about net metering, uh, by, by the way the, the bill is set up today, is that um, those folks that have distributed generation, whether it's solar, wind, or whatever it may look like, um, may, not re may not recover all of the fixed costs that serves them, which would be um, transformer, pedestals, wires, cable, substations, transmission, all of those kinds of sub-transmission, sub all of those pieces. Uh, and so that's the concern that they're seeing in California and Arizona right now uh, and other parts of the United States where uh, when the utilities come back in and uh, begin to try to recover their costs, um, they're recovering it over less kilowatt hours and it's typically those that cannot afford those kinds of distributed generation services uh, that are being um, essentially burdened uh, with that cost that's being stranded uh, by those distributed generation uh, providers. So uh, what the industry is looking at, and, and obviously will be shared with the Public Information Committee, is some of the initial work our uh, rate initiative team is looking at 
Uh, Edward is the uh, is the executive sponsor of that. He may be able to provide a little bit more uh, color commentary. Uh, but um, we're looking at that. Um, no utility has really, um, at least in my mind anyway, has a has, has a good. Uh, implementation that they've done has been effective in this regard, uh, but we are seriously looking at that. And so uh, you may see some things come back to the board over the course of, of the next year or so that would look at how we change those rates to make sure that those fixed costs are being uh, recovered. As an example, in our energy charge, about 70% of our fixed costs are being recovered through the energy charge. So if a solar panel or a wind turbine um, doesn't allow the customer to use that energy charge, those are a lot of fixed costs that aren't being recovered. And so that's the sensitivity uh, that, that we have. And, and from our perspective, we believe it's almost a social issue in, in, in that regard. Uh, those that can't afford are the ones being burdened with those additional costs or those additional yeah. costs. The way I'm thinking about it is you have all the Starbucks and all the Walgreens in town, people who've got the money ahead of time to set up their own net metering and everything, but they still want to be connected to the grid in case they go down. Oh, sure. And yeah. then we're subsidizing them. I'm not worried about the smaller people, you know, as much as these, you know, bringing great big companies that do this. Yeah. And then, you know, <coughs> you know, if you can maybe follow that. Yeah, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a technical challenge in that we're giving customers the wrong price signal. Where, so when they look at their price of energy, in your mind, you think that's really what the energy costs. The energy is only a portion of that. The wires and everything that brings that energy to you is also included in that rate. And whether you're taking the energy or not, you're still receiving that service. And if they're not taking the energy, then they're not paying for that service because they're not being filled under the rate structure. And so when that happens, then we don't collect that money from that customer. And, and then we readjust rates, that cost gets redistributed to other customers because they are still continuing to use the energy. So the technical challenge is, is to set the rates up the right way so that people are paying for the service they're receiving. So if you're doing distributed generation, and you're not using energy, then you're saving the energy charge. But if you're still connected to the grid and you're receiving that standby service, that if you need the power, it's there ready for you, then that's something that needs to be paid for that isn't paid for under the current process. You can't do it here, right? You can't do it here, correct? They pay a substantial standby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and from our industrial, our industrial commercial are probably better aligned right. on the demand charge right. than that are small commercial and our residential. So and it's because of the way the rates are stretched. Yeah. We, we have demand charges on the larger customers. But on the smaller commercial residential, it's all energy charge based. And so we may have to readjust them. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. So on the well, that metering thing, yeah, it's a complicated issue. But I think Tom put this put the dilemma sometimes. His bills come in and say, just do this for everybody. But just what I've seen in the last year is you've got MPP, which has a different customer base, and uh, sort of more urban per se. You've got LDS, a little, a little more utility. And so here they say one size fits all. And I, know we, well, I agree with all these where our positions are. I think that's great. And we have these discussions. But at some point, you know, it's hard to tell them. The center of our team's great with the bills <clears throat> to, to explain the details. If we do get something put together that we'll like that, you can say all you want, but maybe it's one-on-one meetings and condos. If maybe you can get some help with your play. It sounds good, but it doesn't necessarily oh, yeah. work so yeah. well. Yeah. We do that all the time, right? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we've, we've had some of these conversations in some of the public uh, leader meetings that we've had. Uh, one of the things we talk about in public information is uh, the rates team has heard from kind of an expert in this area, senior manager, <coughs> the expert in this area. Um, and it's probably something maybe the board will hear in the future from an expert in this area that also uh, we may use uh, just as a um, uh, an expert uh, around this topic with, with other policy makers as well. And I, and I normally know who the bills are targeted at. I mean, how, last year you knew when one was coming your way. Yeah. So I, mean, I have a pretty good idea of what why where it's going, why it's being done. Um, and um, I get a lot of support 
and I appreciate the comments that you made. You get a lot of internal support. That's why this, why when you go out to the technical experts, there's a lot of feedback that I get. We're just at the early stages right now getting that feedback. The last thing I would say is tomorrow, the governor's state of the state, uh, he addresses the new panel tomorrow. So we'll find out tomorrow what's on his mind. And we'll be monitoring uh, that as well. And, and just to the point of clarification, uh, there are two arms down at the, at the unit camera. There's, uh, there's Legislative District 8 Burkhart, uh, who lives on 54th and Wando, and then there's also Ken Hart, the one who's introduced these bills, and he's from Alpha. So, so uh, don't confuse the two. You saw me, if there's anything else, I appreciate it, and uh, I'll get on the road again. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Safe travels. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Y'all? Yeah, I'm doing sorry. Okay. okay. We'll get to the exciting line polls and stuff. <laughs> weather and system management. Okay, we have two uh, board items. Uh, the first one provides uh, labor only for the removal and replacement of sections of a water wall to the in unit number three, <coughs> water at the uh, North Omaha Station. Uh, sections of the uh, front and rear water wall, water wall, parts to the uh, unit three water have been evaluated. They are recommended for replacement in order to maintain the reliable operation of the unit. This equipment has been in use since 1959. Uh, Installation of materials provided previously by OPPD uh, will occur during a scheduled maintenance outage that will begin on March 1st, 2014. Four bids were received, all of them technically and legally responsive. The engineer's estimate for this work is $1,300,000. And this action asks for authorization by this board to award a contract to Urban Industries Incorporated for $1,333,536. Okay, questions? This would be necessary even if the uh, decision were at some future date to switch from coal to yes. yes. natural gas. Yes. Any others? Okay, second next item is the purchase of transmission tubular steel poles for line 104. And uh, at some point, you know, you might want to talk about what this is about. You want to have some pictures for sure. Uh, these steel poles are required to uh, relocate approximately a half mile of transmission line for a project that Fidelity is undertaking. Uh, and they want to move the existing 345 kV transmission line to the edge of their property. Uh, the proposal includes seven transmission structures. Nine proposals were received. Two proposals were legally non-responsive. One proposal is commercially non-responsive. An evaluation of the proposals was completed and the Trans-American Power Products Incorporated bid was selected as the lowest and best evaluated bid. The engineer's estimate on this project was $677,000. $250. We're being asked to authorize the award of a contract to Transamerica in the amount of $423,737 for the purchase of seven two-year steel port. Uh, well, we might want to talk about what the new structure is going to look like. Sure. Uh, You've seen a couple of pictures. The first one is actually the same poles we're using from uh, Nebraska City uh, to Lincoln on uh, our back transmission line. Uh, the second one, uh, which kind of uh, allowed us to save about $200,000, uh, we don't have the arms on the poles, so the, the vendors, what they're doing, uh, they have new insulator design that attaches to the poles directly, uh, so you don't need these arms. So first, uh, we were able to save a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, second, the design is very slim, and it's a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, less intrusive, more pleasing, uh, and uh, it's been used uh, in the industry. 
we have used it in the 69 KB uh, system and 161 KB system, but we have not used it on our my uh, high voltage uh, D45 KB uh, system. This is the first one we're using this. Uh, but it's proven to uh, work pretty well. So a couple things, I guess we saved money and we also made it look a little bit better. Do you think we'll be using these in the future? Uh, yeah. Definitely, definitely. And that's that's why if you, uh, you know, the engineer's estimate was 677,000, uh, but uh, uh, we're going to end up paying a lot of money. So. They're absolutely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we've done. The wire system's not buying We've got an easement. <laughs> okay. We have no other business in front of us. This meeting is adjourned.